Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Ya Allah Ya Allah Ya Allah Ya Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <coughs> Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Nesta'inuhu ve nastaghfiruhu ve nu'minu bihi azze ve celle. Ve eşhedü en la ilahe illallah vahdehu la şerike leh. Ve eşhedü enne Muhammeden abdehu ve resuluhu sallallahu aleyhi ve sellem. Ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecmain amma ba'd. Ayyuhal Muslimun. With Allah's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. All praise belongs to Allah, the God and evolver, the cherisher, keeper, sustainer of all the systems of knowledge. We seek his help. We ask for his forgiveness. We put our faith and our trust in him. Mighty and sublime is he. I bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship Except Allah alone, the one and only, there is none like unto him. And I bear witness that Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to whom the Quran was revealed 1445 years ago, was the last servant, messenger, prophet to all of mankind. We ask Allah's peace, his blessings, his highest exaltations. Be upon Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Upon his family, his companions, the righteous all. On you, O Muslims, be peace. Assalamu alaikum. <clears throat> that is, may the peace that only Almighty God, Allah, can give you be upon you. We'd like to greet all of our members. Uh, greetings of peace to our members here in the local community, Masjid Muhammad, our national community throughout the United States of America. Those of you all joining us from the international community and uh, one sister I want to acknowledge right up front uh, that was with us a first time, Sister Aisha <clears throat> Izudu. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I-S-E-D-U from Benin, B-E-N-I-N, Benin country in West Africa. Thank you for joining us couple of weeks ago, Sister Aisha. <clears throat> to those who are my family and friends in Bermuda, greetings to you. Uh, Imam Muhammad Abdullah, Birmingham Islamic Center, greetings to you, my dear friend. And it was a pleasure to see Sister Aisha, your wife, in uh, Montgomery, Alabama uh, last week. 
We want to welcome all of you to Al Islam Worldwide Ministry, broadcasting live our Juma Friday prayer from Masjid Mohammed in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, Facebook Live, YouTube Live, StreamYard Live, Juma Conference Line Live, and American Muslim 360. Sister Martha, thank you for broadcasting us last week, this week, and she has informed me that for the entire month of February, they will be broadcasting Mike AM 360, our Juma prayer uh, from Masjid Muhammad. <clears throat> Junaina Abdullah, as always, in Malaysia, greetings to you. Uh, Mujahid and Amina in Okinawa, uh, Japan, Amina Abdullah, greetings to you, our Christian friends. Peace be with you. Uh, your holidays are coming up. Uh, your sacred season they had ash wednesday passover is coming also for our uh jewish friends and christians and jewish friends to our jewish friends shalom to you and also i want to thank my dear friend imam rashad mujahid from tallahassee masjid and nahlu uh the masjid of the bee worker bees in tallahassee for conducting our juma prayer last week today we want to have silent prayers for unfortunately, uh, someone killed in another mass shooting. You all saw it in Kansas City. Uh, the Kansas City Chiefs celebrating their back to back Super Bowl uh, victory downtown in Kansas, Union Station, a million people. And unfortunately, uh, three uh, people get into a dispute and they can't help but solve it with guns. Uh, and the the, the statistics, this is sad. I, I didn't know this. We've had, we, being the United States of America, 49 mass shootings in 45 days. 45, pardon me, 49 mass shootings in 45 days. This is insanity and madness. And so we call upon the lawmakers as often. You all hear me do it almost every week and pray that God reduce this violence. Uh, and as the, the number of the people have said, thoughts and prayers are nice and wonderful, but those thoughts and prayers need to be followed up with action. They need to make some change in these gun laws. So let us have a moment of silent prayer. And also for the 40 or 50,000, Ron, you were sharing with me, of uh, the Palestinians that are being slaughtered in that genocide in Gaza, and we call on the world community to put pressure on Israel to cease the slaughter of innocent Palestinians. Let us have a moment of silent prayer. I mean, <clears throat> may God rest their souls in peace and give comfort to their loved ones. Now, after Juma today, we have our brother, two of our brothers, one here in, in Jacksonville uh, that I grew up with in the Nation of Islam as one of our hard workers, Brother Troy Haywood. He passed, so we'll be having Janazah for him after prayer. And then a friend of mine, uh, Khalid Khan, most of you all around the country, you know him, the, the gentleman or the brother that sells the books. If you went to the Atlanta Masjid in Atlanta, or if you were at any of our conventions through the years, you would see bright skinned brother uh, selling books, brother Khalid Khan. So he passed yesterday. So after uh, our prayers today, we will have Janazah for both of our brothers. Muhammad the Prophet, prayers and peace be upon him, said, and to start our Juma prayer. When it is Friday, the angels stand at every door of every masjid and they record the people in order as they come in, in order of their arrival. And when the Imam sit, where I was sit, sit, uh, seated, where uh, Michael was making the second Adan, when the Imam sits down, the angels fold up their tablets. And they sit and listen to the lecture, to the khutbah. This is a tradition teaching of Muhammad the prophet, that the angel writes down the names of everybody that goes through every door 
of every masjid on Friday. So all of you all who came today and those coming, I know we have other folk coming. We're the early, early crowd. Your names are being written down by the angels. It's teaching Muhammad the prophet that your name, as you came through the door, your names were being written down by the angels. And this happened all over the globe. Our subject today, Allah does not force anyone to believe in him. Now, Rahim, I didn't put the in him because that was a long, so I just said uh, force anyone to believe. God does not force anyone to believe in him. And we begin from chapter 10 of the Quran, verse 99, and this is going to be in two parts because when I was doing the research on it, one thing led to another throughout the Quran. That's the nature of the Quran. It just keeps going and going and going. It doesn't run out. And Allah says, uh, if you had, if all the trees were pens and the, uh, the oceans were ink and you backed it up with seven oceans, never could you exhaust the words and the wisdom of God. So we begin to, Allah does not force anyone to believe in him. Chapter 10, verse 99. <clears throat> Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. With God's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. God the mighty spoke the truth as revelation to Muhammad the prophet. If it had been the Lord's will, they would all have believed. Every one of them on earth. Kulluhum jami'an. Will thou then, and this is Allah revealing to the prophet, and subsequently speaking to us, speaking to people of faith, Christians, Jews, Muslims, others, Mormons, people who believe, if it had been the Lord's will, God's will, the Lord, Rabb, everybody would have believed. Everybody on earth, all who are on earth, if it was God's will. So then Allah asked the prophet the question, Will you then force them, compel mankind against their will? To believe. They don't want to believe, so you're going to try to force them and insist on it? No. Our scholars in the footnotes say, and I'm reading from Abdullah Yusuf Ali, quote, if it had been Allah's plan or his will not to grant the limited free will, this is important, limited free will. As human beings, we have free will, but our free will is not infinite. Our free will is not unlimited. Our free will is limited. So the scholars say that had it been God's plan of will not to grant the limited free will that he has granted to mankind, his omnipotence, meaning his all power, he's all powerful, could have made all people, all mankind alike. All would then have had faith but that faith would have reflected no merit on them. In the actual world as it is, man has been endowed with various faculties and capacities so that he should strive and explore and bring himself into harmony with Allah's will. Hence, faith becomes a moral achievement and to resist faith becomes a sin. As a complementary proposition, men and women of faith must not be impatient or angry if they have to contend against unfaith. And most important of all, they must guard against Muslims in the Muslim world. I hope you're listening. They must guard against the temptation of forcing faith, that is, imposing it on others by physical compulsion or any other forms of compulsion such as social pressure or inducements held out by wealth or position or other adventurous advantages 
Fourth, faith is no faith. They should strive spiritually and let Allah's plan work as he wills, end quote. Now, congratulations to one of our new brothers. Now, he's not even in the United States of America, but we broadcast across the world. And we have views in London, in the UK. Yes, we do. So I, I, I received the message, the report, and most of us here, I don't know, I, I can't speak for you, I don't know. But I, I didn't know him, so I looked him up. But the people in London in the UK know this particular person. His name is Danny Lambo, L-A-M-B-O. Very wealthy, a hotel chain owner, a popular influencer, actor there. And he just made Umrah, and he just embraced Al-Islam in London. Nobody forced him. Nobody put pressure on him. And you hear me say often, Al-Islam is a religion of prosperity. This man is a billionaire. <laughs> now, you would think, if you're thinking worldly only, that he has everything, he, and he does. He has everything he needs materially. He could buy everything, and I won't say the other stuff they said about him because that's not, that's not appropriate for Jumai. The brothers are Muslim now, so it doesn't matter. And this is another thing. Once you become a Muslim, whatever you did before you were Muslim, it's all erased and wiped out. It's, it's, it's considered behind you, okay? So he said, he said, I studied Islam. I read the Quran. I'm paraphrasing. He said, I studied Islam. I read the Quran. I had everything I needed in this world. He's on a, 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 a chain of hotels there, along with all the other things that he does. Very popular in London. European brother. And he said, I, when I read the Quran and I studied Islam, it made all the sense in the world to me and it touched my soul. Yeah. Nobody forced him. Brothers around the world, no need to force anyone in this religion. Chapter 2, verse 256. Allah said again to the prophet, Revelation. And this is our attitude in the United States of America. Now we're following the Quran. Chapter 2, verse 256. La ikraha fid dini qad tabayyana rushdu min al-ghayyi faman yakfur bit ta'aguti wa yu'min billahi let there be no compulsion in religion. Did you hear that? This is 1400 years old. 1445 to be more exact. Let there be no force, no compulsion forcing people in religion. Now, I'm going to suggest follow the logic to its logical conclusion. <clears throat> if there's no force in religion, should we be forcing people to do anything else? Mm -mm, follow the logic. Follow the logic. No. So God said to the prophet, let there be no compulsion. Don't force people to embrace the religion. Why not? Truth stands out clear from falsehood. Now, I know that uh, may fly in the face of what we're looking at in America in politics. <laughs> Truth standing out clear from error, and it does. But you just have some people, no matter how clear you make it, they take the error and make it truth and take the truth and make it the error. Truth stands out clear from error, God says. Whoever rejects evil now and believes in God has grabbed hold of the most solid, trustworthy handhold that will never break. It won't fail you. Never break. And Allah hears and he knows all things. So God says to the prophet, don't worry about those that reject faith. 
those who have faith and they grab on to Allah, they have something they can lean on, depend on, they can trust. It won't let them down. God won't let us down. Our faith won't let us down. I'm talking to the Christians, the Jews, the Muslims, and the, and the people who've been around for any length of time that are believers in God. If you talk to them and you question them, I don't care what level they're on, you question them, they would tell you, like my grandmother used to say to me, God rest her soul, her soul son, trust the Lord. That's what she used to say. So you all have heard the old people say, son, trust the Lord, trust the Lord. She wasn't Muslim, not by practice, but she 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 her demeanor and behavior and everything was Muslim behavior. Our scholars commenting on this compulsion is incompatible with religion because number one, religion depends upon faith and will, and these would be meaningless if induced by force. Truth and error, number two have been so clearly shown up by the mercy of Allah that there should be no doubt in the minds of any persons of goodwill as to the fundamentals of faith. Number three, Allah's protection is continuous and his plan is always to lead us from the depths of darkness into the clear light, end quote. Now let's revisit limited free will. And this issue that I'm going to mention and address. We've heard it many times and we, we need answers to it. We, we're, we're thinking in event. Okay, how come God let this happen? Whatever this is. How come God let happen what is happening to the Palestinians? How come God let Slavery happened. This is African American History Month. God, he allows things. He doesn't cause this evil now. He doesn't cause this evil. In the Quran, Allah says to the prophet, you are blaming God for things that man has done. And because God has given man limited free will, he allows him so much leeway. I hope you understand this now. And in the Quran, Satan asked God, say, God, give me respite. Some people say respite, respite, R-E-S-P-I-T-E. Time, delay, don't interfere with what I want to do. Give me respite, time. Uh, to do what I want to do. And Allah says to, to in the Quran, and I'm sure the, the Christians that they were addressing this would have some way to show me the same thing in their book. Say, God says, okay, go on and do your thing. You have respite. Okay? But you will never be able to get my devoted servants. Uh, I have given them limited free will. I haven't forced them like I forced a rock to be a rock. I've compelled in the nature of the dog to be a dog. I have ingrained in the nature of the cat to be a cat. A cat can't be a dog. A dog can't be a cat. The nature is set. Man can be any of these creatures because I have given him limited free will. I have freed his will to an extent. So he can make choices, she, he or she can make choices to decide how they want to live their life and I'm going to allow them to make their own choices. This is what's in our book, right? Because Allah in his mercy guides <laughs> some of us and many of us. We have been blessed by his mercy. I have to phrase it like that. Because if it's not for God's mercy, 
And now I do know the Christians say this, but by the will of God, there go I. Meaning your life turns out a certain way. So it is by God's mercy. Side note, put this in the back of your mind. Even though we are encouraged, admonished to do good works, to do good deeds, that really is not the ultimate key to get us into paradise. Nope. You know what is? According to the teaching of the prophet, God's mercy. God's mercy. So we, but keep doing the good now. Because that counts. That goes on the scale. That goes on the scale. That's credited to the account. Keep doing that. But don't have the mentality and the mindset that I have bought my way into paradise. Oh, I can buy my way in. Oh, I can work my way in. No, it's by Allah's mercy. And the prophet gave the example of the man who did everything he was supposed to do right when he was alive, kept up all his prayers. And then when he got to the other side, he told God, give me my justice because I did everything you told me to do. And God says, you want justice or mercy? <laughs> <laughs> and Allah says, if I judge you by justice, you're going to wind up in hellfire. You know why? He told him, if I judge, this is the teaching of Muhammad the prophet now. Say, if I judge you by justice, you, you forget something. Every good thing you did, I made it possible for you to do it. I gave you your breath. I gave you your body. I gave you your limbs. I gave you your heart. I, I gave it all to you. And you want me to judge you by justice instead of mercy? Okay, I will judge you by justice. And based on justice, you deserve to be in hellfire. So we learn from that and we take from that. Yes, be as good as we can for as long as we can to as many folk as we can. But always keep that in our mind that God, I want your mercy, not your justice. You've given us this limited free will. We don't have the mind and the will to do whatever we want to do. And see, that's the problem in the world now. The problem in this world we're living in, across the globe, there are people on this earth that think they have the right to control, do whatever they want to do with no consequences. You have limited free will. And when you step past that, you're stepping in that area of respite, respite that God gave to Satan. Your time is coming. And your time will come sooner than you think. Allah does not force anyone to believe in him. Like Rahafiddin. Let there be no compulsion in religion. Well, I thought the Muslims, I thought you all spread Islam by the sword. I thought Muhammad the Prophet spread Islam by the sword. Critics, liars. Critics, liars. I'm speaking to Facebook, YouTube, StreamYard. Not just you all sitting here now. There are people out there that believe that, that Islam was spread by the sword. Al-Islam was defended by the sword. There's a difference between spreading it and defending it. Okay? It wasn't spread by the sword. It was defended by the sword. And I stand here as a witness, as do most of the people here. I stand as a witness. No one, not a soul, forced me to become a Muslim. And I got to admit now, there was some heavy pressure in the nation of Islam. Yeah, we we use the pressure, a whole lot of pressure back in the old days. We like we use a lot of pressure, but still, even with that kind of pressure, nobody forced me to embrace Islam. Nobody. I did it by God's grace. God guided me to the religion of Al Islam. I was raised in the Baptist church, but nobody forced me. Say, you know, John, you 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 gonna be, you got to be a Muslim. Nope. It was my choice by God's grace. And that's been 50 years ago. I know I don't look it. Alhamdulillah. 
<laughs> now that's the grace of God too. That's God's mercy. <laughs> you don't get roughed up with that bad life. You young people out here, some of y'all, 25 looking 50. Really? And I see them. I know some. I met some. What are you doing with your life? How old did you say you were? And I was on a plane recently with the older gentleman sitting next to me. I don't know if I shared that with you all. It's, it's relevant to what I'm saying now about being forced in religion and the benefits. And he was older, and he started telling me all the aches and pains. You're a pain American brother. And he started, I guess he felt, he, I, I made him comfortable enough to tell me all his hurts. So he started telling me all his ills and his pains. And, uh, and then he looked at me. He said, you don't, you don't, how old are you? I told him, I'm not telling you. I told him, he said, he said, and you don't have any medical sick. I said, none that I'm aware of. By the grace of God, he said, "Well, let me ask you a question. Huh? How how is it that you look like this?" Yo, hey. I said, "Well, sir, the only thing I can attribute it to, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't eat pork, I don't go to clubs, I don't stay up late at night, I don't chase crazy ladies." I was going down the list. <laughs> he said, "I do all the above." <laughs> And I didn't respond to say, that's why you look like that. <laughs> Let there be no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear for Mary. So if you ask anybody who's been around in this religion, Shaw, Lizette, Alan, Ed, Ron, Mike, ask the people, I'm talking to the young ones now, ask the people, and you all around the country, ask your mothers, your fathers, your grandparents that are in this community, say did anyone force you to embrace Al-Islam, be a Muslim? And they will say, absolutely not. And listen, if you force someone to do something, don't you have to stay there consistently to enforce it, to make sure they stay with it? Nobody's enforcing me. Nobody's bothering me. Uh, if, if I, God forbid, I change my mind tomorrow and go do something. But I can't find anything better than the Quran. I don't mean any disrespect to my Christian friends and family members and co-workers. I've read the Bible back and forward. So I grew up in the church. And the reason I, I, I started reading it was because my grandmother, living in Jacksonville, could not read. She was born on a slave plantation in Charleston, South Carolina. It's African American History Month, so I got to put some of that in there. And she would have me as a young man read the Bible to her because she couldn't read. I'm talking 12 and 13 years old. I was reading Genesis. Didn't understand it, but just my, my grandmother would say, son, read that. Start at the beginning. And I would read to her. She was a Christian. And I would read to her the Bible. And that began my spiritual journey in scripture. Yes, that's how I learned. So I, 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 I don't know anything better. I haven't found anything better. You all out there, you, 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 you want to suggest something to me? I've studied, I've studied pretty much all of the religions. Christianity, Judaism, Mormonism, Buddhism, whatever. I've studied it. And I haven't found anything as complete comprehensive as al-Islam that address every aspect of the human being's life. I haven't. Now, if you are aware of it, please let me know. But I don't think it's anything that's out there. And by the way, I've studied the ancient mythologies, ancient Egyptian mythology, ancient Roman mythology, ancient Greece mythology. I've studied those mythologies. Nothing comes close to the Quran and the life of Muhammad the prophet. And Allah, as I sit on the first part of this, said that Muhammad the prophet, Kafatinlinas, speaking of Muhammad the prophet, present peace be upon him. Now, this is for all people all over the world now, all over the earth, two billion Muslims. 
And I just told you about this brother just, just embraced Al-Islam. That's a billionaire out of London, European brother, Danny Lambo. There's nobody forced him. Okay? So Allah says in the Quran of Muhammad the Prophet, he is capitally nice. You know what that means? He is sufficient for all people all over this earth. But what's, what, what is that telling us? Whatever the human being's main issue, important issues of their human life, you and I, we will find that expressed in the teachings of Muhammad the prophet, prayers and peace be upon him. You will find that address in the teachings. You like business? All right. Got an example in Muhammad the prophet. You like culture? Exactly. Now, you know, there are some Muslims who miss that. That the prophet enjoy culture. Mm. You know, anybody ever talk about that? He enjoyed entertainment. Uh oh. I got the proof. You know, I don't get up and say anything now. Not about the religion. That I came back up. Nope. On an occasion, culturally speaking. You, you artisans out there, you musicians and entertainers. Michael is very good. Ron, very good musicians. My friend, Uthman too, all of them, you all are my friends and brothers. There were some African dancers in the time of the prophet. And they were good with their spears and swords dancing. This was their routine. And the prophet, praise and peace be upon him, this is in the Sirah, also in his life, the Hadith. He had his young wife, Aisha. May Allah be pleased with her. He said, oh, look, I'm paraphrasing it now. The, the African dancers are in town. Would you like to see the show? I'm putting it in our language. She said, yes. He said, come on. And they watched them dancing. Now, I've been there. I've seen the the, the, the Saudi dancers, uh, they hit the, what they call the duff. The, we call it the tambourine, the duff playing. I've been with them doing it. As a matter of fact, one time we were sitting there and the Arab brother, they were dancing. They were doing the sword display. They were singing and they were hitting on the tambourines and the duff. Now, I, I don't know. There's, there's, there must be somebody online uh, sitting here today that's thinking music is haram. That's the only reason this is coming out of me. No, seriously, because I don't have that in a note anywhere. We're sitting there and they're going through the music, African American history Month culture. And the, these are the Saudi Arabs. Now, now, if you paid attention, you remember the previous pharaoh, not this one, the previous pharaoh was over there dancing a little with the sword. He was happy because he just cut a $440 billion deal. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough to get you dancing. <laughs> and everybody was complaining. Look at him. Look at him. He's over there. I said, well, he's pretty intelligent. He just signed $440 billion worth of contracts, and he's as happy as he could be. So we're sitting there, speaking of culture, and they started putting on the performance like the African performers did in the time of the prophet. The Arabs did. And Imam Muhammad, God grabbed the high station in paradise. And by the way, we were sitting there with the sheikhs. This is in Saudi Arabia. And I'll tell you the festival, so you could look it up online. It's called the Festival of Janariya. You can find that, all right? And Imam Muhammad looked at us, and he said, well, I guess this destroys this thing about music being haram. He said, and I know the learned scholars and the sheikhs brought us here to this festival. So we could see it for ourselves. Oh, and we had a good time, by the way, too. We enjoyed it. They were very good. And Imam told us, he said, the learned scholars in Saudi, they brought us here. This is back in 1990. He said, they brought us here to show us, don't listen to all those misguided hadiths. We enjoy culture like Muhammad the prophet did. Allahu Akbar.
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على الرسول الكريم صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد أيها المسلمون <coughs> again with God's name the merciful benefactor the merciful redeemer may his peace his peace and his blessings be upon his noble and generous messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam greetings to you dear brothers and sisters again assalamu alaikum wa ba'd and what follows thereafter and i do apologize i uh, wasn't trying to make you laugh but some things are just humorous okay the second part of our juma now speaking of the culture let me what they say button that up um, the cultural environment that we live in in America, much of it is only good for the garbage. Garbage can. Unfortunately, the people in this society, in other places, but I live in the United States. Unfortunately, in this environment, the culture has degenerated and those who at the top managing benefiting profiting from it have used and utilized the african-american people unfortunately to take the culture down to the bottom yep made a few of them rich popularize a few of them, and they market it across the world. Brothers and sisters out there now, we got to do better. You've been fortunate, you got to do better. Clean it up a bit. <clears throat> I was in um, Montgomery, Alabama. This is African American History Month the second part of the Juma Qutbah, addressing concerns, community issues, concerns. Imam Mikhail Sabri, the Imam of the Muslim Community Center uh, there in Montgomery, Alabama, and his community, very nice, wonderful community there, invited me to be their guest speaker for the weekend of activities, focusing on Al-Islam from Africa to America, uh, remembering our past, building on our future. And part of the weekend's events was a trip to the Legacy Museum. Now, I don't know if any of you all have ever been there, those of you all online watching and listening. Uh, if you haven't, this is a must-see tour. You must go. Now, if you can't physically go, technology, you can Google. I went online and looked it up. The Legacy Museum. And also it'll connect you with Equal Justice Initiative, which is a memorial that has these clay tablets. Now, this is this is heart-wrenching now, but it's reality. Clay tablets of African Americans, African slaves lynched during slavery and lynched after slavery, all over the South, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, Alabama, Tennessee, Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas, all over. And thousands, and some, and they had names of the people at the memorial. And some unknown, but every, basically every Southern state, lynching, lynching whole families this is the history this is now i'm not saying this so we can be mad with anybody upset with that because the people living in 2024 had nothing to do with that let's 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 clear that right now those of you all out there feeling guilt among the european american community no need really un unless your mentality is like this now okay but you had nothing to do with slavery. we understand that however you benefited your children benefited. Some of you directly 
indirectly, economically benefited. So while I was going through the museum, the Legacy Museum, there was a part of the presentation, which I'm just going to read this for you on this economics, uh, that was talking about the economics of enslavement. So I asked the lady, because it was on the wall, uh, and I said, hey, what, can I get this information? She said, yes, you can purchase it in the bookstore. This book, Slavery in America, the Montgomery Slave Trade. Okay, So as I finished the two, two and a half hour tour, uh, Imam McCall Sabri, the community, made sure I saw this uh, Friday and Saturday, the memorial on Friday, the, the museum on Saturday. So in this book, The Economics of Enslavement, read this to you and we'll pray. Quote, and they say, we didn't give anything to America. We didn't contribute. But let's, let's see. Beyond its benefit to Southern plantation owners, American slavery was a major engine. This is African American History Month now. They don't want us to study our history. We don't depend on them, whoever the, the they are. Get it ourselves. Beyond its benefit to Southern plantation owners, American slavery was a major engine of prosperity throughout the United States and worldwide. The labor of enslaved black people in the United States fueled explosive economic growth and wealth accumulation during the 19th century, that's the late 1800s, 19th century, particularly within the vast cotton and textile trades, textile clothing. Many Northern businesses, you hear that? Not just the South, the North. Many Northern businesses and families made wealthy in this era still retain those riches today and can directly trace their fortunes to the toil of the enslaved. By 1830, one million people in America one million people in America labored in the cultivation of cotton, and almost all of them were enslaved. Cotton constituted more than half of the United States' global exports. In addition to cotton, nearly all American industries were dominated by an economy dependent upon the work of enslaved people. Merchants in the North traded cotton, sugar, and other agriculture products grown by enslaved people. Banks and creditors, now listen to this. Banks and creditors accepted enslaved human property as collateral when underwriting loans. What? Our people were collateral. When the banks wanted to underwrite the loans, what, what kind of collateral you got? Well, I got some slaves. Human beings were collateral. Like your house is collateral, your cars are collateral, whatever. And they were authorized to repossess enslaved people if a debtor failed to repay the loan. And this way, financial institutions became directly involved in the slave trade. As the domestic slave trade expanded, to meet the demand created by the booming cotton industry. Cotton fueled America's emergence as the world's fastest growing economy. Between 1810 and 1860, one million enslaved Africans were forcibly transported from the Upper South to the Lower South and slave traders accumulated vast wealth in the process. Federal laws like the Fugitive Slave Act facilitated the widespread kidnapping for profit that left all black people vulnerable. The bodies of black men, women, and children, this is their language, enslaved in America were assigned monetary values throughout their lives. An enslaved person's purchase price was a painful reminder of how his or her life was commodified as a commodity. And changes in this assigned monetary value could profoundly affect an enslaved person's destiny. Some of the greatest heartbreaks 
and that tool was heartbreaking. And inhumanities of enslavement arose from the cold valuation of human life. I'm almost done. Enslaved people were also appraised, like you appraise your house. Oh, God. They were also appraised as human assets to allow slave owners to report on their property holdings for the purposes of insurance, wills, and taxes. Values for enslaved people could reach more than $5,000, representing more than $150,000 today. Slave owners regularly ignored family bonds among enslaved people to prioritize profit goals and treat it, okay, reproduction as an economic process. You all out there want to know why you're not responsible in taking care of your children and you got all these baby mamas and babies all over it? It started on the plantation. You were used just as a method to reproduce children for economic uh, benefit for the enslaver. After puberty, an enslaved woman's value was largely set based on her ability to bear children. Enslaved men were most prized for their physical ability, and men in their 30s considered to possess peak strength and skill could be advertised as quote unquote prime hands, full hands, or A1 prime, like you were talking about beef or meat. Depending on health and strength, enslaved men typically receive high appraisals well into their middle age, while enslaved women lost much of their value once past childbearing age. Because enslavement, last sentence here, or paragraph, because enslavement was a permanent and hereditary status by law, enslaved men and women had no recognized parental rights and children could be sold from infancy from their parents. A child's value was calculated annually and influenced by health demeanor, and skills. Many historical accounts describe the grieved parents attempting to raise money to buy their own children. Typically, these efforts were unsuccessful. Profits from slavery laid the path for the Industrial Revolution, helped to build Wall Street, and funded many of the United States' most prestigious schools. Today, Slavery is a prominent, though largely ignored, foundation of this nation's wealth and prosperity. Major companies, they're not holding back now, so don't get, don't get upset with me, you all, when your name is called out here now. This, I'm reading from the book. Major companies and universities profited off the institution of slavery, including Aetna, Inc., New York Life Insurance Company, J.P. Morgan Chase, Harvard, Columbia, Princeton, and Yale. In 1838, two of Georgetown University's early presidents organized a massive auction to help the school. 1838, don't forget it. Georgetown University, they got together, organized a massive auction to help the school evade bankruptcy. How did they do it? sold 272 black people for $3.3 million. That's how they got out of bankruptcy. Georgetown, the university itself, as one professor later said, the university itself owes its very existence to this history, which is a microcosm of the whole history of American slavery, end quote. What a tragedy. So you all out there, Think you haven't contributed anything to the United States of America? No Wall Street without slavery. No Harvard without slavery. No Columbia. No, no J.P. Morgan Chase. The bank without slavery. No Georgetown without slavery. Don't you ever forget it. Our Lord grant us the best at this life has to offer us and grant us the best that the next life has to offer us and save us from the punishment of the fires of sins. 
and O Allah, out of your mercy, please reduce and eliminate this gun violence in these United States of America. And Allah, out of your mercy, please bring peace and relief to the Palestinians. Amen. The promise of Allah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashadu an na Muhammadur Rasulullah. Ashadu an na Muhammadur Rasulullah. Hayya la salat, hayya la salat. Hayya la fulah, hayya la fulah. Kakama to salat, kakama to salat. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. Muhammadur Rasulullah. You all look where you're standing now. Make sure you're lying straight. Good to see you. How you doing? Good to Those of you all joining us, uh, if you're new to El Islam Worldwide Ministry, our Friday prayer, you can join us online for Salat, East Coast, Central Time Zone. And those of you all who prefer the, to join us that on the West Coast, you can. Uh, as you know, when it's time for your prayer properly, you still have to make salat, even though I'm talking to the West Coast now. Uh, you still have to make salat at that time, even though you're joining us for the Juma. And when we finish our salat, as I said, we will have the Janazah for our brother Troy Hayward and Khalid Khan out of Atlanta. Allahu Akbar. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نبض وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين نمت عليهم غير المقضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين ألم نشرلك صدرك ووضعنا أنك وزرك الذي أنكر ظهرك ورفعنا لك ذكرك فإنما الأسر يسرى إنما على أسر يسرى فإذا فرقت فانصب وإلى ربك فارغب الله أكبر سمي الله لمن حمده الله أكبر Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نبض وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين نمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قل هو الله أهد الله صمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أهد الله أكبر سمي الله لمن حمده الله أكبر Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar.
الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين انعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين امين تقبل الله may Allah accept our prayers <coughs> now let us stand and have the janazah ghaib ghaib means absent that the deceased person is not present here our brother Troy Hayward and those of you all who know brother Troy uh, Ahmed called me Today, and Michael told me earlier that the funeral for Brother Troy is tomorrow at one o'clock. Where might Paxton Paxton Revival Center? That's on Edgewood and Commonwealth at one p.m. tomorrow. So those who can make it by uh, do that. Brother Troy was a very, very dedicated, long-time uh, worker uh, in the old nation of Islam and when Imam Muhammad made the transition uh, transition from the Nation of Islam's teachings, Brother Troy did the same. So may Allah forgive him and grant him paradise. And then my friend Khalid Khan, those of you all online in Atlanta and around the country, I'm sure you know uh, Brother Khalid Khan. If you met him, you bought a book from him. I bought many books from him out of Atlanta, Georgia. He was the brother, Zaki, that sold the books right outside of uh, Atlanta, Masjid. So he passed yesterday. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and artwork too. That's right. He sold artwork too. You're absolutely correct. So we'll make Janazah for our brother Troy Haywood and uh, brother Khalid Khan. <coughs> Allahu Akbar. الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله May Allah forgive our brothers Troy and our brother Khalid Khan now, brothers and sisters, on the way out the door, if you didn't do it coming in, please make your contributions and your donations. I say it every week. We have expenses here. If you like, put your name on the pad. Those of you all online joining us, uh, you would like to support our work here, Al Islam Worldwide Ministry, our global ministry, worldwide ministry. I see the graphic just came up on the screen. You can go online, Ministry. Uh, and you can contribute, hit the donate button once you get there, donate online. If you'd like to mail your contribution in, as some of you do, 
mail it to Al Islam Worldwide Ministry, P.O. Box 3204, Jacksonville, Florida 32206. All of your contributions are appreciated. We thank you all very much. Some of you all are consistent. We appreciate you. Some of you are first time donors. We appreciate you. Whatever you can contribute to our work here. And everywhere I go, I was in Montgomery this past week. Uh, the brothers and sisters over there were telling me the same thing they told me in Albany, Georgia, in New York, and around the country, that they really appreciate what we're doing here in Jacksonville, Florida, spreading the message, clear uh, teachings of Al-Islam, the Quran, the life of the Prophet, and Imam Wadi Thudin Muhammad. And many of them say to me that they appreciate that during COVID, we were the main site that they could get on. So alhamdulillah, it's good to hear uh, the feedback from you all, and I welcome your feedback and your input. Thank you all very much. May Allah bless all of you all, those of you all who contribute to our efforts here in Jacksonville, Florida. Join us next week, inshallah, same time, same platform, our platforms, because we have a number of them now, YouTube, StreamYard, Facebook, American Muslim 360, and our Juma conference line. Ramadan is coming up. I didn't say much about it yet because we're getting closer. We still have about another 20, 25 days or so maybe before Ramadan. So maybe inshallah, uh, we will say something about that next week. We're in the month of Shaban, the eighth month. Next month, March 10th or 11th, Ramadan. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for joining us. Stay safe. May God bless you to our Christian friends. Peace be with you, our Jewish friends. Shalom. And thank you for joining us.